Let's go! Let's go! Why do math books always look so sad? They're full of problems! <laughs> Why did the teacher wear sunglasses to school? Because her students were so bright! <laughs> Chapter 6, verse 17. Accept God's salvation to be a helmet. Guess what time is it? It's birthday time! And today I have a special guest here with us. Hi, Cheryl! Hi! We're gonna play a game that the birthday people is gonna have the name Jumbo Up and we gotta guess what birthday is, right? Let's Whoa. see if you can guess before us. So, before we start, we have to suit up because it's birthday time. My first one is um, O-E-Z, hmm. Zoe. Oh boy, that's hard. A T O I. Oh, I know, I know. Nathaniel, happy birthday, Nathaniel. Happy birthday, Nathaniel. My next one. Oh boy. E K. I know, no, no. Kathleen, happy birthday, Kathleen. Yay! I didn't know. Oh wow. Next one is, oh, no, 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 I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, yes, now I am. Carolina, happy birthday, Carolina. Happy birthday, Carolina, oh, yay. Oh, and why? I know, happy birthday, queen. That's your first birthday. That's so cool. Oh. And my last one, L. Wow, that's a big name. It's hard as well. <laughs> no. Yeah, yes, yes. Gabriella. Happy birthday, Gabriella. Uh, yes. Now let's tough. see, Cheryl, if you can guess all your names. All right. First name, Ho or guys, I think you're going back to school this week. Ew. Can you believe it? 
Well, it's been a great summer and it's been a great month of August. Well, today we're looking at the very, very last piece of armor. And so it's going to be the helmet of salvation. And I've got a really, really special lady who's gonna teach you all about it this morning. Her name is Pastor Bev, and she is the leader who looks after all the children's pastors in the Eastern Ontario District. That's a really big responsibility, but I know she's up to the task. So why don't you get comfy, sit down, open up your ears, open up your eyes, and get your heart nice and ready for listening about the Helmet of Salvation from our good friend, Pastor Bev. You all know what a helmet's for, right? Firefighters, hockey players, football players. You might even wear one when you're riding your bikes or going on your scooter. They're to look cool, right? No, they're to keep our brains safe. Did you know that our brains keep 70,000 facts in them at a time? Or you could record three million movies with the amount of memory that you have. The other cool thing is that your brain also produces enough electricity to generate one small light bulb. Amazing! That's why we need to protect our brains. My friend Jake wears this when he's on a construction site at work to protect his head. It's not only important to protect our heads physically, but also spiritually. So we need to put on our helmet of salvation. But what does salvation even mean? Salvation means to be rescued. Just imagine that you're out on Muskrat Lake on your big pink flamingo floating. You get all the way to the middle and you can't get it back to the shore. If someone came out to rescue you, they would be your savior or your salvation. Jesus Christ is our rescuer. He is our salvation from sin. Satan doesn't like it when we accept this free gift. He sometimes messes with our minds. He wants us to feel like we're not good enough. Maybe you feel because you get angry somehow that you can't accept this gift until you're nicer. Or maybe that you're not smart enough, strong enough, pretty enough to be able to tell others about Jesus. We are more than conquerors. We know that we have Jesus in our hearts and we need to put on that helmet of salvation to remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Does anyone know where I am now? Before I came to OV, I heard about this amazing event. And then when I got here, I got to experience the mud pit. It doesn't look nearly as amazing this year though, does it? There are weeds are all around, there's no water added, it hasn't been dug out, so it, and it's not as much fun as it used to be. Our friendship with Jesus can look a lot like this if we don't put on our armor by reading God's word every day. We want to be ready and we want to be able to see our purpose and certainly it's more fun. Our Bible story today is about two guys who really rocked putting on their helmet of salvation. Listen up. Paul and Silas were missionaries thrown into jail for sharing their faith in Jesus. Paul and Silas told many people about Jesus. Some were so happy to hear this message, but others were angry. One day, a man got angry at Paul and Silas, telling the people, and he had them beaten, arrested, and thrown in jail. They told the jailer that if these bad guys escaped, he would be killed, so the jailer chained them up and put them in the innermost cell so they couldn't escape. Their ankles hurt, their backs were hurting and bleeding, and they were left hungry. But do you know what they did? They prayed and sang songs to God because they loved God and knew He was with them in this difficult place. Have you ever been somewhere you didn't want to be? What was your reaction? Did you sh start sharing Jesus there? My first reaction is sometimes to whine and complain, but not Paul and Silas. They had on their helmet of salvation that protected their thoughts, and they knew God was with them. Around midnight, while Paul and Silas were singing, a great earthquake happened. Their chains fell off, and their feet were free, and the doors of the prison opened. The jailer woke up and drew his sword about to kill himself, but Paul and Silas shouted, Don't harm yourself! We are all here! The jailer was surprised and knew that their God must be real. He asked, How might I be saved? And Paul and Silas were very happy to tell him, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. The jailer took him to his house to clean their wounds and his whole family was saved. This week we've learned how to put on the armor of God to be protected and to fight the battle. We have to communicate with the leader of this battle, the Lord Jesus Christ. It, we communicate with God through prayer. Like Paul and Silas, some of you are going through a really difficult time. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus' free gift and you feel really alone. 
Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So today when we pray, you can call on his name and never feel alone again. I'm just gonna take a few minutes to pray with you. If you've never asked Jesus to be your best friend, this is a great opportunity, but you can do it anywhere. It might be in your bed before you go to sleep or in your bathtub, when you're driving in the car, wherever, God is always with you. And we're just gonna say a prayer right now. Please join me as you look at this beautiful view. God, thank you for being the friend that hears us whenever we talk to you. Thank you for protecting us and directing our thoughts when we put on your belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, when we get on those sandals of peace, wrap up our shield of faith, when we have our sword and our helmet of salvation. God, help us to dig into your word, the Bible, each day to understand it and to share it with our friends and families this summer. Make us brave like Paul and Silas. And for the kids today who want to accept your free gift, we ask that you forgive the wrong things we have done and help us to choose to follow you each and every day. You are an awesome God. Amen. Hi kids! Today I'm going to show you how to make this cool helmet of salvation. See? very nice it's easy you just need to use the leftovers cardboard that you might have at home or even any kind of thicker paper that you can find all right so it's very easy first thing you need to do is get of course your cardboard and you're gonna cut two rectangles this way one is gonna be 21.5 inches or 21 depending the measurement of your head this way okay the second one will be this piece here that's gonna be one inch by 10 or 10 and a half inches all right so just uh, trace that on your uh, cardboard and cut it and we are gonna be ready to go so I'm gonna put it here aside now and we, the next step is you're gonna need to go to our Facebook page and print off a template that I posted there and you cut out of your paper here and put on your um, cardboard and trace and cut around. So you're gonna have these pieces here as well. You're gonna need two like this to go, okay? So now we have the big rectangle, again, 21 by two. 10 by one inch, this front and the two sidings as well. So you're gonna start by getting your big one like input together this way and keep it together to make sure that's gonna be strong and won't break when you're playing with your uh, armor of God. Okay, now that you tape together, I suggest you to, to stick it together on top of this connection here. So that is gonna be hidden on your design, okay? So let me put some glue. Just to stick it together this way. Once you stick together, you're gonna add these two pieces here. So put your glue. together here that's how it's gonna look like once it's all together so next step you're gonna need to find in your house a piece of paper that is colored and you're gonna cut a piece of paper that will be 10 inches by 5 inches so you're gonna place on your table got this the skinny one that we cut, cut it first and then you're going to stick it like this once you put together you just need to cut this little cool kind of hairy stuff I added just another piece of paper just right here to cover the cardboard and then you just need to just fold it this way 
together. So that's how it's gonna look like. And then you just need to fold. You fold it this way and you stick it together. Do the decoration the way you want. And you can use markers uh, as I did here, use some paint. And now you just set, ready to play with your full armor of God. Make sure you make your whole armor of God and play with it. If you miss one of episodes of this month, you can always go back on our Facebook page and check the previous episodes and make it, All right? So now, I'm just gonna be here playing with my armor of God and my helmet of salvation. And I see you next time. Bye! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! That is a spectacular Yay! helmet of salvation, Jonatus. So cool! I cannot wait to go and make my very last piece of armor. But a couple of things I want to have you guys keep in mind before you head off. So even though our Zoom calls ended last Friday, I want to let you guys know how special those times were to me. It meant so much to get to know a lot of you better and spend time talking with you and praying with you and playing games and learning from the Bible. And you know what? Maybe in the future, we'll try to do that again sometime. So for now, make sure that you keep reading your Bible and you keep spending time with God every day, even though the Zoom calls aren't happening. Also, I know you guys had your birthday segment earlier today, but I wanted to wish all of you a very happy birthday who had one in the month of August. Also, it's back to school time, isn't it? A lot of you, I think, are going to be heading back to school as of tomorrow or this week. So I'm praying for you. I want you to know that. Keep in touch with us on our Kids Ministry Facebook page. And on there, we're going to continue to post all kinds of really fun stuff because right here, this, eKids every Sunday, that's not coming to an end. We're still doing it every Sunday. So now let's check out some amazing pictures of the pieces of armor that you've been working on this past week. So guys, have a really great first week back at school, and we'll see you here again next Sunday on eKids.
Good morning and welcome home, Evangel. I'm so glad to be together with you online and on site on a Sunday morning. It's good to see you and it's gonna be a great day. If you are online and it's your first time uh, tuning in with us, I wanna say thank you for checking us out. If you're on YouTube, you can hit subscribe and then that little bell beside the subscribe button. Or if you're on Facebook, you can follow our page. Either way, you'll be able to find us easily in the future. If you're on site and it's your first time with us, just give a little wave. We're really glad that you're here. Thanks for coming today. My name is Patty Miller. I am the lead pastor of Evangel and you have just joined our Sunday morning worship gathering. I'm standing up here on the second floor of our church building right now, overlooking Cabot Square and our city. This is my favorite spot in the entire church building because it's the place where I can look out and remember where God has placed us, that God has placed this church in downtown Montreal. And I'm so glad that we are here. Let me give you an idea of what else to expect for the remainder of our service. If you're online, you already saw our um, eKids at 10 after 10. That happens every Sunday morning, our eKids segment. If you're on site, you've already joined us in some worship and prayer live, and we will do that again at the end of our service. Uh, next, we're going to have Mariana. will read some scripture. Um, Chrissy and Kingsley and Josh and Steph will lead us in worship. Jamie is going to lead us in prayer today, and I'm going to share some from scripture. We're also going to have communion together as a church family. So if you are online, you want to make sure that you have a little bit of bread or a cracker and some juice or some kind of beverage. If you're on site with us, you should have been offered one of these on your way in. It's an individually packaged um, communion cup that you can use and you'll want to have that ready for a little bit later in our service. I'll give you an information update on what's happening at Evangel and then we will close in prayer. If you are online with us as we premiere, um, I want you to know that first of all, there's some hosts that are in the chat and they are posting links or posting comments there for you as you need them. You're welcome to use that space to also respond or to interact with each other. I also want you to know if you are online as we premiere, that if something resonates with you during our service uh, or you want someone to pray with you, there's a link uh, that's been posted in the about section or pinned to the top of the chat. You can click that link at any moment and just give us your name and phone number and someone will call you within 60 minutes of the end of our service today. If you are on site and you want to receive prayer, of course, once the service comes to a close, you can just wave down one of our pastors and we will come and pray with you. If you are online watching this later in the week on your own time, you can contact us anytime uh, for prayer or for information. And all of that is in the about section of what you are watching right now. Uh, if you are on site with us, I want to say it's really good to see your smiling eyes above your mask. Please do keep your mask on over your mouth and your nose throughout the entire service. And if you are on site, why don't you just stand with us right now and let's open our service in prayer and welcome God into this sacred time and space. God, at this moment, we say thank you for all of the ways that you have created for us to gather you are the one that has made it possible for us to gather uh, both online and on site. And we are grateful for that. We are grateful for your mercy. We're grateful for your provision. We're grateful for all of the things that you have done. We're grateful, God, for your salvation. Now, Lord, as we go into our worship time, as we go into this sacred time, would you just quiet down all the other distractions? Would you bring our thoughts into line with yours? Would you uh, raise up gratitude and faith and hope within us again? And would you help us to go through this time and when we come to the end, know that we have been impacted, we have been shaped by the power of our Almighty God. Come and be present during this time. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name, everybody said together, amen. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice, rejoice in our confidence hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. 
live in harmony with each other. Don't be so proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone.
worship together. Lord, although we're worshiping in a very different and sometimes strange way, Lord, thank you that we can still draw close to you in these times. Thank you, Lord, that as a congregation, we've been able to see each other a little bit more, come together a little bit more. God, I just pray for all the congregation of Evangel. Lord, would this time of uh, in church, with this time with you, just be an opportunity for us to be refresh to be renewed lord god i think of anxieties especially re resulting from going back to school and all of the challenges and unknowns there lord god i pray just a sense of peace would be over the congregation over each parent over each student over each adult student lord god would they just know that you are surprised by this you haven't been caught off guard god that you are totally in control of these situations that they face lord would we lean on you and on your understanding not on our own in this time lord i thank you for uh, uh, the opportunity to hear and to understand your word lord as we go into our time of message lord i pray that you would draw us close to you that we would hear you that we would um, experience your presence through the word and through this time together god we're so thankful that we can praise you and worship you together in a morning like today in jesus name we're going to take a few moments this morning and uh, look at God's Word, take some time to engage with it. You may have noticed that, as I did, that it started getting a little bit chilly this week, not during the days, but in the evenings. And so there was one evening this week when I pulled out a sweatshirt, I pulled out a hoodie and, uh, well, I'll just show it to you. I realized it was, uh, it was this Vanguard one. See that? Great shirt, right? really great shirt. It was a gift that I got uh, last February when I spoke at Bible this Bible college, Vanguard College. It's in Edmonton, Alberta. And they gave me this hoodie as a gift when I spoke there at the end of February. February, when life was normal. <laughs> when the word coronavirus was just sort of a headline that I wasn't really paying much attention to. I flew to Edmonton in February on a plane that was crowded with other people. Uh, I got to this college. We met together in crowded classrooms. There was one session we had just with female students and me, and we were jammed into the school's cafe area. There wasn't a mask or hand sanitizer anywhere in sight. I didn't know it, but within about two weeks, everything was going to change, as you know, of course. So I pulled out my hoodie this week and I thought, oh, wow, I miss normal. I miss it. So much has changed and I'm okay with change. I don't mind change. I understand that change happens, but I do miss parts of that much simpler world of only last February. And maybe you do too. So we're on week five of this series of what doesn't change. Because in the middle of all this change, it's really easy to start feeling a little bit lost, a little bit adrift, just wondering where are the boundaries? What's the solid ground? What is it that I can rely on? And the wonderful thing about the Christian church is that we, we can adapt. We do adapt. We're actually pretty good at it. My friend Dom Russo, who's the pastor of the 180 church in Laval, he just smiles and says, remember, uh, the church survived the fall of the Roman Empire. We will survive this. And he's right, we will. But still, it's comforting. And, and more than just comforting, it's important that we identify in the midst of all this change, it's important that we identify what doesn't change, what won't change, what's not gonna change here at Evangel. So we're on week five of this. We're gonna look at, uh, in part, at one of the New Testament letters today, 2 Corinthians. But before we read it, let me set the scene for you, okay? You have to remember that much of the New Testament is letters that were written for specific situations. They're letters to real people at real moments in time. And so they weren't initially intended to be some kind of spiritual textbook that would be used by Christians 2,000 years later. They didn't know that when they were writing it. But as time went by, uh, certain ones of these letters, there was agreement within the, the widespread church, and it took a long time, agreement that these were the letters that should be preserved by the church. We believe that was inspired by God, and it was agreed on that these were the letters that should be preserved as scripture. And that's what we have in our New Testament today. So we have letters that are written from somebody to somebody else, 
And sometimes the book of Acts helps to fill in the gaps or sometimes other letters around it help to fill in the gaps. Sometimes we're reading the letter going, huh, okay. So I guess there must have been a situation like this happening that caused this response in this letter. That's a simplified version of what actually has been happening, which is a lot of thoroughly academic research that has gone into this ancient literature to help us understand what was happening at the time. So let me set the scene. There's a church in the city of Corinth you can, on your own time, read the story of how that church came to be. It's in Acts chapter 18. It's likely a house church, as most of them are. And we have two letters that were written from the Apostle Paul to this church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And the letters are a little bit, little bit fun to read. They're a bit dramatic. Um, it seems that the church in Corinth was, you know, a bit a bit dramatic. Uh, there's no time to go into it all today. There's a lot there, but they're very proud of themselves in Corinth. They're pretty sure they're one fantastic church. They like to think of themselves as a great church and they are, they are, but they've got some issues. They've got a little, little drama. And so Paul in his letters is writing a lot to help them with that, to help them manage that. So he gives them some good principles on how to manage, for example, how to manage spiritual gifts like prophecy and tongues. This is how they're supposed to be used to avoid just absolute mass chaos. Um, he, he notes that they've got some conflict. They appear to be uh, suing each other at times. And Paul's going, Really, really, this is what you're going to do. And so he's bringing some correction to that. He's also correcting some stuff happening that's, it's kind of embarrassing, really, because, you know, for example, when the church is supposed to be sharing a meal uh, that includes the Lord's Supper and everybody's supposed to bring something and they share it together, but it wasn't being shared. Only the rich people were eating. Some of them were getting drunk while other ones went hungry. So, so that kind of thing is happening in this church. It's a bit dramatic. It's also clear, by the way, as we read these letters, that somebody has been spreading rumors about Paul and accusing him maybe of mismanaging money or of abusing his authority in some way. And it's really caused some disruption, some difficulty in the close relationship Paul has had with this church in Corinth. So you can see in his letters that he's responding to that as well. So I'm telling you all that because it's important that we understand these letters give us a picture of real life, a snapshot in time. These are not distant, removed, philosophical essays. It's real life. As Paul is trying to lead, he's trying to teach, he's trying to do his job, what God has called him to do, while he's also interacting with real people in real situations because that's how life goes. Sometimes it's complicated. In the middle of all this, there's another situation that's happening. You may remember that the very first followers of Jesus, the first Christians, they were in Jerusalem and they were very soon scattered because of persecution that happened in Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem, there's still some Christians there. There's still churches there, but less than there were. And it's a very difficult place at this moment in when this letter is being written. It's a difficult place to be a Christian. And so the Christians that are in Jerusalem are really impoverished and they are really in need. And Paul has for some time been talking to churches outside of Jerusalem, including this church in Corinth. These churches, by the way, exist because Christians fled from Jerusalem and it carried the message of Jesus. And Paul has been talking now to these churches outside of Jerusalem in other parts of the, of the country. And he's urging them to take an offering and to send gifts for their fellow Christians who are in Jerusalem and who are suffering. And so it's a long-term fundraising project is basically what he's been doing. And it feels long-term. They might not have thought of it that way. We would because we live in the days of GoFundMe when you can raise boatloads of money in, you know, seven minutes if you've got the right social media. Um, but there's, there's no internet at this time. There's no phones. There's no cars. You're walking from place to place. And it, it takes a while to, to pitch the project. And then it takes a while to collect it and follow through. So Paul had mentioned this project in his first letter to the church in Corinth. 
So, and, and even when he mentioned it to them, they clearly already knew about it. They just had some questions about how they should manage it. So in that first letter to the church in Corinth, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses one to four, this is what he says. Now, regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you've earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers that you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me to go along, they can travel with me. I just want you to notice a couple things from that scripture before we get to the main one. I want you to notice this is about, number one, this is about them giving outside themselves. I want you to notice that Paul is advocating budgeting and making a plan as they handle their finances. He's also putting procedures in place for accountability to make sure that the money is handled well. And he's including them in, in those procedures. He's giving them control uh, for transparency as well. I just want you to notice that because it's still today and it was then very important. These are important things in how churches handle money. So now we're in 2 Corinthians the second letter that Paul is writing to them. And Paul is now following up on that project. He's also at the same time, it's probably a universal truth that money is a delicate subject all the time. And so it's a little bit delicate, but he's also trying to remember, he's trying to rebuild a relationship that has been damaged by rumors. So it's really delicate for him. But just because there have been some challenges doesn't mean the need in Jerusalem doesn't still exist. And so he's trying to follow up on that with them. Furthermore, Paul, who is always, he's always talking about unity in the Christian church. He's talking about uh, individual churches all being part of one big church, part of God's family. And, and he talks about unity because it's uh, in part because it's a reflection of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. Persons And one of the most amazing things uh, about the church in Paul's eyes and in everybody's eyes at that time was that God's people had expanded uh, so that it was not only um, God's people, the Jewish people, which it had been for centuries, but Jesus on the cross had done this incredible work of reconciliation so that the relationship with God was now open for anyone, Jews and Gentiles. And that was huge in, in the world that they were living in. That was just really quite radical. And so you also want to keep in mind that, and I'm about to make a few mass generalizations, but just stick with me here. Okay. You also want to keep in mind that the church in Jerusalem would have been primarily Jewish Christians. These are the ones that have been God's people for a long time. They're the, they're the first ones. And, and it's the churches outside of Jerusalem that are newer and that likely would have been a mix of, of Jewish and Gentile people or even just primarily Gentile Christians. So the Gentile Christians who are newer to faith and used to be outsiders, they're the ones that are being asked to help the Jewish Christians who were God's people for centuries. And it's this, all of that becomes a huge, massive statement of the reconciliation and the unity that exists and that is characteristic of God's church. Okay, I want you to have that frame of reference in your mind. One more thing, okay, deep breath, we're almost there. One more thing. One more piece of information. There were multiple churches that were participating in this project. The church in Macedonia, which is a different place again, they were also suffering a lot of perse persecution. They were quite impoverished and they had already collected their offering for the church in Jerusalem. Corinth, to whom this letter is written, the church in Corinth, they're not, they don't seem to be uh, in such a place of as much persecution. They're not, they don't seem to be suffering as much. They seem to be okay. They just got, as I said, a lot of drama going on. They're pretty proud of who they are as a church. They see God at work through all kinds of areas in their church, through spiritual gifts, through good speakers, through their passion, through their excitement. 
But it seems that for whatever reason, they've stopped setting money aside. They've stopped working the plan of collecting money to be given to Jerusalem. And Paul is writing to them to say, you need to finish what you started. Don't you want to see God working his grace through you in this area as well? Okay, you tracking with me? Are we clear as mud? So, okay, so from that perspective now, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Paul says, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, but they're also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So, we've urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, we've urged him to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many other ways, in your faith, in your gifted speakers, in your knowledge, in your enthusiasm, in your love from us, I want you to also excel in this gracious act of giving. I'm not commanding you to do this, but I'm testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Here's my advice it would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness that you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean that your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Okay, now here's what I want you to see. And there is so much here that we don't have time to look at today. But I want you to notice two things. Number one, it was important that they handle finances well as a church. It was important that they make and follow a plan towards their goal, that they handle the collection of it well, that they handle the transportation of it well, that there's everything is above board and lots of accountability. It was important that they handle finances well as a church. And number two, it was important that giving outside of themselves be a part of their life of faith. That was a big deal. It was important. I assume they were already giving. Giving to help the poor in their own uh, world, to facilitate their worship gatherings, giving for all of that, that's always been part of Christian faith and it was part of biblical Jewish faith before that. So I assume they were already giving as part of their regular lives. This is about giving outside themselves. And it's not at its foundation, by the way, based on the need of the recipient. It's about giving that's based on the gratitude of the giver recognizing what God has given and out of that grat gratitude, giving back, giving outside of themselves. It's also based on trusting God with our whole lives. You know, it's kind of a funny thing. And uh, I never make eye contact with anyone that when I say this, but lots of us are willing to trust our spirituality and even our eternal souls to God, but not our money. That seems weird to me. And, and so this is based on trusting God with their whole life, including their finances. 
And giving outside themselves was a way that God was going to work through them, just like he was working through them in so many others' ways as well. Giving to other believers outside of themselves was huge. Giving, it was a statement of unity between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. It was a statement that they understood, that the church in Corinth understood that they were part of the whole family of God, not only their own local expression of it. So, at Evangel, we're in this series of what doesn't change. And here's what we've said. We've said seeking God through prayer, that's not going to change. We've said that our church community matters, and that's not going to change. We've said that worshiping through music, it's not going to change. And I want you to know today that giving outside of ourselves, not going to change. It's... It's just what we do. We give outside ourselves. It's what we've always done. We have never been a church that only existed for its own self-preservation. We have always been a church that gives to believers in other places, that gives to other churches, that gives to other organizations. We have always been a church that serves our community in various ways. And we have always, to my knowledge, been a church that handles finances with integrity and with accountability and transparency. None of that is gonna change even in a pandemic, when everything else is changing. So just like we're going to keep on seeking God through prayer, and you know how we're doing that. We're praying on site on Sundays. We're praying online on Thursday evenings. We're fasting and praying on Mondays, some of us. Just like we're continuing to value our community of faith. And by the way, don't forget to send in your we're still here videos because that's part of our community of faith. And just like we're going to continue worshiping through music and through singing, we are going to continue giving outside of ourselves, especially in God's family, especially with other believers. And here's what we're going to call it. You ready? A month of Sundays. Say it with me. A month of Sundays. You didn't say it. Come on. Ready? One, two, three. A month of Sundays. Just like the church in Corinth, Evangel is a pretty great church. I mean, we've said it before. We are one fantastic church. We have our moments. We have our drama sometimes. Every church does. And uh, But we are strong in many ways. We are strong right now. We're not suffering like some are. Even in a pandemic, we're doing okay. Are things tight financially for us? Of course they are. Our lead team met this week and we went over the finances and the finances are tight. Of course they are tight. But we are used to hammering nickels into quarters. So we're just hammering them a little bit harder right now. And uh, here's what I want you to know. Last spring, when this whole everything started, our lead team immediately focused on two priorities, caring for our staff and caring for our missionaries. So I want you to know, that, and, and please don't hear this as a statement of judgment. Every church is in their own space and their own situation. But I want you to know that while some churches that we know uh, were forced to lay off staff, we did not. And while some churches that we know felt they had to make the decision to, to cut their missions giving, we did not. And we had one month where we gave slightly less uh, to our missions giving and our regular support of our missions giving, but only one month. And it was just slightly less than what the normal is. And I'm happy to tell you that today our other bills are paid too. God is meeting our needs and he's doing it through you because by the way, there are no angels coming down and writing checks out to Evangel. So we're doing okay. And in this church, we give outside of ourselves and that is not going to change. So just like the church in Corinth, we have made a plan as we always do. We do this every year. Our lead team approves a budget every year. Our fiscal year starts on July 1st. Perhaps you can imagine how much fun, and I'll put fun in air quotes, how much fun it was trying to create a budget in May and June of this year when we really didn't know what to expect. We didn't have enough data to go on to know what was going to happen. And so we created a budget knowing full well that it might might change because there were too many variables to know for sure. And so we're just watching that budget very closely. We're living within our means. But our budget and our plan includes giving to others. It includes giving to others who are in God's family, but they're outside of our own local church. And we would like to finish what we started. 
in three areas. And for fun, they all start with the letter M. So this month of Sundays is brought to you by the letter M. Number one, missions. This is our international focus. You can see on our website, if you go look at our website, we support 10 different families or people in nine or 10 different nations. They do different things in different places. They develop leaders of integrity. They look after impoverished or orphaned children. They strengthen uh, churches that are led by local people. They offer medical help where it's needed. And in many of those nations, the economy has collapsed and the need is real because of COVID. For some of those missionaries that we support, some of the support that they receive from others uh, in Canada has dropped and the need is real. So we made a decision to continue supporting them even in a pandemic and we wanna take steps to ensure that that happens. That's missions. Number two, M word, is Montreal. That's local. In addition to the non-financial ways that we serve our community, we also give to La Gifem Women's Shelter. We give to Christian Direction, which serves people in who are in need in downtown Montreal. We also support Cal and Chrissy Cron, who you know, they have been leading us in worship many times through this lockdown. They moved to Montreal a year ago intentionally. They've been spending that year learning French and volunteering their time in our community where it's needed. They are planning to stay in Quebec as Mission Canada workers looking to serve in the unique place that God has for them. They're very intentional about that and we support them. We also support David Ritz and we support Danielle Klingelhofer, who both work for two different organizations that serve university students, that serve college students, that serve international students. They offer, depending on which organization you're talking about, they offer harm reduction and safety measures. They also offer spiritual support and guidance for students. And these students, many of them are arriving back in Montreal right now. And we made a decision to continue supporting them even in a pandemic, and we wanna take steps to ensure that that happens. The third M is Masters College and Seminary. I don't have a hoodie from them, but I have a flyer that I got from them. And this is our educational focus. And by the way, yeah, it's, it includes IBQ as well, Institut Biblique du Québec, which I can't make start with the letter M, but I do have a hoodie from them as well. But Master's College and Seminary and IBQ, that's an educational focus. And you may have noticed that we often have Bible college interns here at Evangel. These are students who are training to be pastors, training to be church leaders. And when they are here, we work to give them the best, well-rounded training experience possible. Some of them come from Master's College and Seminary in Ontario. Several of our pastoral staff, including me, attended that school. That's where we got our training. And these students are specifically trained to pastor churches within our denomination. We tend to train our own leaders, and that education is fully accredited, but it's not government subsidized. Institut Biblique du Québec in Longueuil is the French language version of the same thing. Some of you attend there. Jonatus, who is on our staff right now, is a student at IBQ. Both of these schools are absolutely necessary for training pastors and leaders of our churches in the future. And we always budget to give to both of them. This year, more than ever, they are in need as COVID has forced expensive adjustments to everything that they do. And we made a decision to continue supporting them even in a pandemic. And we wanna take steps to ensure that happens. We wanna be sure that we can follow through on that plan. So all together, if we take missions, Montreal, MCS and IBQ too. If we were to add together what we already planned to give them between September 1st and the end of December this year, that amount is $23,004. I don't know why the $4, but when you break it all down, that's what we are planning to give from September 1st to the end of December, $23,004. And I'm wondering, how much of it we can manage to raise in a month of Sundays. Maybe we can raise much of it. Maybe we can raise most of it. Maybe, and just forgive me as I play with the letter M here a little bit. 
Maybe we can mobilize our members to marshal our monies to meet the material needs of missionaries, Montreal, and Master's College and Seminary and IBQ2 in a month of Sundays. Brought to you by the letter M. I know, it's cheesy, but you gotta have some fun sometimes. So we're gonna see what we can do. We're gonna see what we can do by the last Sunday in September, which is one month from now. In our financial books, just so you know, all of that comes under missions and it's already budgeted. We just need to raise the funds to fulfill that budget. So we're going to do five Sundays, including today, to set aside the amount that we have committed from now to December to give to God's family outside of our own local church. Now somebody says to me, Patty, why are you trying to raise it all now? Why, why do you have to put the push on? Why do we have to do it? You know why? because some of them are in serious need right now. It's a weird year, it's a difficult year, and we don't want to make them wait until December if we don't have to. Why are we trying to raise it all now? Because we'd like to step out in faith a little as one fantastic church and see what God can do through us even in a pandemic. So I'm asking you to consider today and over the next four Sundays, what can you do? How can you be part of this with us? Jeff and I are going to be a part of it as well. Maybe you can do, I don't know, $5 a week. That's the price of a latte. Maybe you can do $50 a week. Maybe you can do $100 a week. Maybe you can do more. But just like Paul said to that church in Corinth, I'm going to say to you, give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, we don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. We only mean there should be some equality. So as you consider, give with joy. Give out of gratitude for God's provision, for what the ways that God has provided for our church and for us during this season. Give out of trust that that same God is going to continue to provide for us, that we've given him our whole lives. And let's together make a giant statement of unity, a giant statement of recognition that we understand it's not all about us. We are part of God's family all around the world together. So I'm going to ask you to make a plan. Make your own plan. In fact, maybe we could take a few minutes and do it right now. And if you want to, you can, you can do it on your, in your own space, maybe with a journal like I do. Maybe if you're with your spouse right now, you want to exchange a look with them and go, we should talk about this. Maybe if you live with different people and you have some roommates or you have friends, maybe you want to do something as a team and you want to encourage each other to join together on something and just consider how can you join in? Maybe you, you're going to say, you know what? I'm going to give what I would normally spend on snacks this month. Or I got an unexpected bonus at work and I'm going to give from that. Or because I'm working from home, my expenses have actually dropped. They've been less. So I'm going to give from that. I'm going to give you 30 seconds right now to just pause and give and take a moment and invite God into that planning process. Write it down talk it out with your spouse or make it a plan to talk to your roommates or anybody else if you want to do this together. But let me give you 30 seconds right now to pause, to consider, and to invite God in as you make this plan. Did you start thinking about it? Let's pray together. God, from joyful hearts, we express our gratitude to you today. We just say thank you for your provision. Thank you uh, also that we are part of something that's greater than ourselves. 
We are part of something more than our own world, part of something more than even our own local church. We are part of something global, something worldwide. Thank you that we get to stand together with other believers, even in a pandemic. Thank you, God, for making us a church for 104 years that has always given outside of ourselves. God, we wanna to continue to be that church. And so we're asking you to help us as we figure out a plan, as we have conversations with people we need to have conversations with, or as we just figure out our own thing, we're gonna ask you to help us with our finances, help us to trust you with our finances, not just with our souls. And, and come and be present in our whole life even in the financial area of our life, teach us what it is to live generously and to give outside of ourselves. God, I'm asking that you would do a miracle in this church. And as, it, as each of us just walks it out and starts to give um, what we feel you've called us to give, that we would be able to actually raise that $23,004 by the end of September and even more so that we can generously and extravagantly bless those outside of ourselves who are part of the family of God. Help us to do that and we will celebrate and honor you with that in Jesus' name. God, now as we go into communion, we submit our lives to you. And we confess that God, uh, we confess any sin in our lives, we repent of any sin in our lives. And God, as we now move towards shifting into taking communion together, would you make us right within ourselves? Would you make us clean and holy before you? And help us to honor you as we do. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you're ready this morning to share communion together with all of us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are welcome to join in this with us this morning. If you are online, you want to have some bread or a cracker and some kind of a beverage, juice or wine or whatever it is that you have. If you're here with us on site, someone has given you one of these little individually packaged communion cups. If you don't have one, just wave your hand right now and someone will bring it to you. Let me just show you how it works in case you're not familiar with it. There's two stages. First, you're gonna lift up this clear cellophane bit and you're gonna find the wafer under that. And then you're gonna lift up the tab that's on the edge of the cup and you're gonna to lift that up and that's where the juice will be. So let's gather our things together and let's prepare to take communion today. You ready? Interestingly, it's from Paul's first letter to Corinth that we see the pattern that we follow as we take the Lord's Supper together. And, and it's interesting because he wasn't trying to set up a thing that we would read in church every time we take communion. He was simply trying to respond to a church that was kind of behaving badly around the Lord's Supper. And he was bringing some correction to it and they were because they were forgetting the sacredness of it. And so he corrects them and then he reminds them of what it's about and what the point is. And here's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Our God, we say thank you for your body given for us on the cross. We say thank you and we honor you and we remember. Let's take it together, shall we? Verse 25 says, in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in, remember, in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus, we just say thank you for this cup that represents your blood shed on the cross for us uh, so that we could be in a new covenant, a new relationship with God. We're so grateful that you did that for us and we say thank you. Thank you, our God. Let's take it together.
God, thank you for the way that you continue to, to um, bring us into your presence, the way that you continue to give us mercy and grace, the way that you continue your, to connect with us and to be in relationship with us. It is our privilege, our God, to remember your sacrifice and to thank you for it. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you just some quick information, a few updates before we close this morning. Number one, I want to remind you that if you are online as we premiere and you want to receive prayer this morning, something has resonated with you, you wanna to talk to one of our pastors or you want to receive prayer, there is a link that has been pinned to the top of the chat or it's in the about section of, of where you're watching this video. And uh, you can click that link, give us your name and phone number and someone will call you within 60 minutes of the end of our service today. If you're on site and you want to receive prayer, just wait until we dismiss people and then you can wave your hand and one of our pastors will come and pray with you. Second of all, I want to remind you about our park hangouts. They are still continuing for as long as the weather holds. Once winter hits, we won't be able to do them anymore. So I really want to encourage you. This is one of the ways that we have available to us to gather together with our family and friends. So check out our info sheet on our website at evangel.qc.ca and you can see where the various park hangouts are that are happening throughout the week. Number three, I want to remind you, would you please send us your We're Still Here selfie videos? Just hold up your phone, turn the camera towards yourself, turn it sideways so that it's landscape version and look at it, hit that video button and go, hey, Evangel, I'm still here. Or hey, Evangel, we're still here and send that into us. Um, the details are on the screen and you can know where to send that so that we can edit it all together and remind ourselves, remind all of you of who all the wonderful people are that make up this church family. Finally, um, all the ways that you can give are on the screen. And so whether you are participating in our month of Sundays brought to you by the letter M, as you just heard about, all of that will fall under the missions category. So anything you want to give towards that goes in under missions. If you are doing your regular giving that just keeps Evangel going as well, because all of our bills still keep coming and that's how we pay the bills. Either way, I want to say thank you for standing with us. Thank you for being part of that with us. All the ways that you can give are on the screen. And uh, if you're on site, there will be a station as you leave the church uh, sanctuary, there will be a station on your left where you can give as well. If you're on site, would you stand with us? If you're online, you're welcome to stand with us, but let's stand this morning and let's close in prayer. Our God, thank you. You have, you have met with us. You have um, spoken to us. We have been shaped and impacted as we have worshiped, as we have prayed, as we have engaged with your word, and as we have taken communion together. God, would you now be with us as we go into our regular lives? And would you help us to carry Jesus well? Would you help us, Lord, as we walk out into our world, help us to do good, help us to love each other, and help us to reveal Jesus to a world that really needs to know you. Keep us safe, keep us well, and bring us back safely next week. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you and have a fantastic week.